I am Paul Wagner, and I got to Vietnam in July 1968, arriving at Cam Ranh Bay Air Base in Tu Corps. This video shows a sample of where I lived and worked during my year in country, as we used to say. Vietnam was divided into four military regions, referred to as I Corps, in the northern part of South Vietnam, bordering North Vietnam. Tu Corps primarily covering the Central Highlands. Three Corps, the region around and including the capital city of Saigon. And Four Corps, covering the Mekong River Delta area. GIs carrying bags, like me, had just arrived from the U.S. to begin their one-year tour in Vietnam. Planning the, panning the ramp in front of the passenger terminal at Cameron Bay shows a variety of aircraft. Here you see a C-130, a C-7 Caribou, and a C-123 Provider. Cameron Bay Air Base is situated on the South China Sea located approximately 180 miles southeast of Saigon, now known as Ho Chi Minh City. I had been assigned to the 310th Air Commando Squadron, renamed the 310th Special Operations Squadron, as a pilot flying C-123 aircraft. The 310th was based at Phan Rang Air Base, about 50 miles south from Cameron, going feet wet off the coast over the South China Sea. This pan shot, taken from the Officers Club, Hill shows barracks areas, main base support areas, the control tower and flight line. The F-100, B-57 and Australian Canberra operations areas and the aerial port were located on the near side of the runways and the C-123 aircraft maintenance and operations were located on the other side of the airfield. We see two F-100s taking off while a C-123 holds for a midfield takeoff. Notice the Cham Temple in the far background. The aircraft in the overhead pattern is an OV-10, one of the aircraft used for forward air control duties. Some of the local area shows the proximity of Fan Rang to the beach area. The shuttle bus with screened windows took base personnel to the beach each day. I went there once during my tour. Joe Gillen, who had a motorcycle, gave me a ride one day to Topcham, a village not far from the base. The architecture has a strong French influence from the colonial days.
The 315 Special Operations Wing Headquarters, 309th, 310th, and part of the 311th Squadrons were located at Fan Rang Air Base in Tu Corps. The 311th also operated from Da Nang Air Base in I Corps. The 19th Squadron was based at Tonsonut Air Base in Saigon, and the 12th, known as Ranch Hand C-123s, operated from Benoit Air Base. Right on cue, here comes a Ranch Hand C-123 spraying something, maybe even the defoliant Agent Orange. Everyone who served in Vietnam was exposed to Agent Orange. A typical day for a C-123 crew member started around daybreak. A mission consisted of 8 to 10 sorties, and crew members flew five to six days a week, depending on crew position. Smoke belched from the oil collected in the bottom of cylinders of the R2800 radial engine during the first engine start in the morning. This example mission, a typical mission, mission consists of 10 planned sorties, the first taking cargo to Delot. The cargo could have been food, ammunition, building supplies, JP4, fuel, rubber donuts or myriad other loads. Delot Airfield in the Central Highlands sat at a field elevation of 4,951 feet and had a 4,300 foot runway 60 feet wide. This is according to the Tactical Aerodrome Directory of March 1969. As we pan the ramp area, you can see the terminal building we affectionately refer to as the Howard Johnson's, since it resembled the style of Hojo restaurants in the States. We can also see fuel donuts containing JP-4 fuel for Army helicopters. The civilians sitting on the metal pallets are Montagnards, the indigenous people of the central highlands of Vietnam. The name Montagnard means mountain people in French and is a carryover from the French colonial period in Vietnam. Delot was an in-country rest and recreation area for the Vietnamese military. Some said it was also used by the North Vietnamese Army uh, for R&R &R, and there was a sort of truce by the two factions when in Delot. Delot was considered the breadbasket for Vietnam because it produced much of the fresh vegetables and other foodstuffs for most of Vietnam. I never saw any farm machinery being used there on the small farms. All work was done by manual labor. They used every bit of agriculture space as evidenced by the terraces and the work was done mostly by the women. Next we flew to west to Giannia, a 2,000 foot laterite runway carved from the top of a mountain. Laterite was a soft rock commonly used in developing countries for runway construction that became very slippery when wet. The 80 foot wide runway had steep drop offs on each end and no overruns. Visible airplane wrecks on each end illustrate how unforgiving the airport was if a pilot landed short. There was just enough room for two C-123s to be on the ground at one time. Assault landings were generally the rule to avoid enemy ground fire. To perform an assault landing, we'd fly over the airport at three to 5,000 feet and put our gear down, our flaps down at 80 knots 
And on final, when the runway disappeared below our nose, we would dump our nose, aim at the end of the runway, and flare about 500 feet above landing. And that would give us a fairly decent landing. Like that. Full reverse was required to stop and that enveloped the aircraft in a cloud of dust. Jet engines were necessary on takeoff to get airborne before the end of the runway and quickly climb above any possible ground fire. We took off from Giannia on our way to Dong Tre, where we offloaded the remainder of our cargo. Dong Tre was a 2,500 foot long steel run matted runway 60 feet wide. The Tactical Aerodrome Directory directed us to contact the Special Forces on an FM frequency before landing to determine if the field was secure. At Dong Tre, I ran into Virginia Military Institute classmate Randolph Williams, who I thought was still at Fort Lewis, Washington. It is a small world indeed. I crossed paths with several other VMI classmates during my one-year tour, such as Howie Lloyd, Butch Herbaugh, Scotty Dodson, shortly before he was shot down and killed in Laos, and hung bomb Stuckmeyer. Here, Randolph took over the camera duties to take a picture of me as a young lieutenant. In the rugged terrain of the Central Highlands jungle, chromatic waterfalls abound and distinctive mountain landmarks recognizable by all aviators who flew in two corps were visible on the way to Pleiku Air Base. Pleiku, sitting at 2,434 feet elevation, was the home to various aircraft such as the venerable C-47, A-1s, and a variety of helicopter types. We picked up livestock this trip. A technique we used when carrying cows was to hold the aircraft on the ground during takeoff as long as possible, then abruptly pull the nose of the aircraft up into a steep climb, pulling two, three Gs, which forced the cows to their knees. They stayed on their knees until we got to our destination. If we allowed them to stay on their feet, they tended to move around the cargo area causing big shifts in the aircraft center of gravity. We took livestock to special forces camps where they were kept alive until time for slaughter, since refrigeration was not usually available. It was a short flight to our next stop, Pleasure Rang, located near the Cambodian border. The field elevation was only 955 feet, and the pure steel planking PSP runway was 3,500 feet long and 80 feet wide. A Montagnard village can be seen in the background, and the fortified camp uh, to the right was occupied by soldiers of the 5th Special Forces. We had been directed by the airlift control element to stop at Anke to pick up some troops. As we followed the highway into Anke, a helicopter can be seen flying below us just above the road. More than just vehicles used some of the highways in Vietnam, it seems. Anke was hard to mistake for another airfield because the 1st Air Cavalry Division patch had been re recreated on the side of the mountain behind the airfield. Anke was in a valley at 1,380 feet field elevation. The next stop was Quinyon. 
also in Tukor on the South China Sea. The 5,000 foot asphalt runway ran north and south of, at the base of a mountain which went right down to the sea and had a reputation for producing tricky winds. Kunyuan also had a well-stocked post-exchange, at least by our standards. One advantage of being a C-123 crew member flying throughout the country on a daily basis was the opportunity to make a quick PX run to buy hard-to-find items such as Coca-Colas and 8-track tapes that were not available or in stock at the Fan Rang base exchange. Quignana was a busy airport with helicopter, tactical airlift, and strategic airlift constantly arriving and departing. The latter C-124s and C-133s came from the U.S. to by way of Guam, Japan, and the Philippines. Hi, Dick. That's Dick Deal. He's another squadron mate of ours. You know that it would be untrue. You know that I would be a liar if I was to say to you, girl, we couldn't get much higher. Come on, baby, light my fire. Come on, baby, light my fire. Try to set the Any time C-123s backed out of a parking spot, the loadmaster or flight engineer was always on headset providing instructions and helping maintain clearance from vehicles and other aircraft. Our load departing Quinion was fuel donuts destined for a bailout. During takeoff, we could see a billboard advertising Botany 500 clothing. A Catholic church was also visible on departure. The beaches and new hotels have made Quignon a popular resort location today. The scene avoid concept was very important in Vietnam. We flew tactical visual flight rules, DFR, and it was not uncommon to see other aircraft, such as this F-4. Bailock, our next destination, was in the Central Highlands at 2,750 feet. It was always a challenge to make a smooth landing there. The runway was 3,500 feet long, but had a high hump at the midway point and approaches on either end were over hills. The PSP runway was only 59 feet wide, so our 110 foot wingspan definitely required a center line landing. We offloaded our fuel donuts and picked up a combat support team with its truck and trailer. Destination Benoit.
Benoit in Three Corps, about 30 miles north of Saigon, was the home of the ranch hands, the C-123 unit that sprayed the defoliant Agent Orange throughout Vietnam. Another aircraft operating from there was a C-130 unit that carried the jet-powered Fire Bee drone under the wing of a C-130 and launched it to fly a programmed route over North Vietnam to take pictures. At the end of the mission, the Fire Bee deployed a parachute and was retrieved in midair by a specially equipped helicopter. We left Benoit for Vinh Long, a helicopter base in Four Corps with a PSP runway 60 feet wide and helicopter revetments situated close to the runway edge on both sides of the runway. While we were offloading, we got a call from Alsi directing us to make a detour, this time to Budop, on our return to Phan Rang. Budop was on the Cambodian border, so the Tactical Aerodrome Directory directed us to land to the north on runway 01 and take off to the south to avoid overflying Cambodia, which we were not supposed to overfly. Our call sign is always Bookie plus our mission number, so we were known as Bookie Birds. On our way home after a long day, we saw another Bookie Bird also on its way home. So we decided to fly back together. You know, misery loves company. Occasionally, a C-123 had maintenance or other problems that resulted in an overnight stay at a forward operating base. We tried to avoid that if possible because a disabled airplane made an enticing target for the enemy. One day I was tasked to go to Tuidong, a 2,000-foot laterite runway northwest of Saigon to retrieve a C-123 that had gotten stuck on the wet laterite runway two days before. Tuidong supported a riverine force based there. The riverines, known as the Brown Water Navy, patrol the Mekong River and its tributaries using patrol boats armed with 50 caliber machine guns and mortars. They lived up close and personal with local river people whose loyalty was always questionable. A C-7 Caribou, which could land on a 1,000-foot runway, took me there. When we arrived, the runway was still damp and sticky. So I actually backed up a road leading to the runway to give me some extra runway for takeoff. The C-123 you see here on final approach with one wing low is having to deal with a crosswind from the right. Landing a C-123 in a crosswind could be difficult because of the large vertical tail and small rudder. It was not uncommon to run out of rudder and use differential power on final. 
if winds were in excess of 15 knots, we had to have a tug attach a cable to the upwind wing before we could turn crosswind to keep us from tipping. When a crew camp member had a final flight in country, it was customary to do something a little different when arriving at home base. This six, four, six ship formation was the final flight from Major Caruso and Lieutenant Norm Pace. Fan Rang was the target of rocket and mortar attacks on occasion, so when enemy activity was discovered, local aircraft, in this case F-100s, were dispatched to help the good guys, us, route the bad guys, and that's what was happening here. They dropped ordnance on a hill just a couple of miles from Fan Rang to preclude any possible action after dark. That was a typical day in the life of a C-123 crew during a one-year tour in Vietnam. After 12 months of fun and games, it was time to return home. I chose to hop a ride on an O-2 for a FAC mission between Phan Rang and Cameron Bay, where I was meeting my flight home. It may not have been the smartest decision on my last day in country, but it was a way to have one more moment of excitement before heading home. You're so young and pretty And one thing I know is true You'll be dead before your time is due Yes, you will See my daddy in bed at time See his hair been turning gray He's been working and sleeping his life My TWA Freedom Bird can be seen in the background offloading new arrivals, eager for adventure and wondering what was in store for them during the year ahead.